This program contains adult content. Is there a God? A uh, big atheist. Really? What am I, an idiot? Come on. That yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else. But it's not true. It looks like far left lunacy. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. You don't need to follow anybody! It's not human intelligence! If someone doesn't value logical consistency, what logical argument are you going to give them that will demonstrate that they should? Welcome to the show, Rebels. This is episode 155. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan, and of course in studio have the two, gra- uh, the two greatest co-hosts ever. Aw, oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Ryan Duffy. Yes, sir. And Mr. Matt Mitchell. The resident misanthrope, Matt. <laughs> and tonight we are delighted to have in studio with us uh, special guest, Mr. Roy Jeffs. Hey, everybody. <laughs> That's me, Roy Jeffs. <laughs> and it's warm in here. This is, I think, the warmest day of the year so far. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even the, AC, we... the AC's not on yet. Maybe we'll have to kick that on in a bit. Um, this is episode 155. Today is Thursday, May 4th. May the fourth be with you. Oh my God. I got to tell you about this. Okay. Uh (laughs) So there's this gal on my team at work, right? And this skirt, this dame, this chick. Yeah. Mm hmm. (laughs) So this fucking broad, right? (laughs) This maiden. (laughs) No, but she like, she organizes like potlucks for the team and everything. She's kind of team mom, self proclaimed or whatever. Uh Oh. And it's fine. But she's a little bit like, uh, Mm, I don't know. She doesn't know a lot of things. So so she's <laughs> slow. <laughs> she's kind of dumb. Is that what you're saying? So, I mean, she's really nice, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, she has to be. She's really dumb. She's, so, got, a, she's got a, you know, play to the kindness of others. Yeah. So, so we had two other departments that we work fairly closely with contact her about setting up a potluck for today. And uh, she had no idea what the reference was. For May the 4th, right? Uh, so she sent a message out to let everyone know about the pot- potluck. Um, and she opened the message by saying, let the 4th be with you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a potluck for Cinco de Mio <laughs> on May 4th. And I'm like, May 4th, it's right there. It's May. the next line. Like, that's the whole reason for the doing yeah. it on. Because we're going to be at work tomorrow on Cinco de Mayo. We could have done it that day. But we're doing it today <laughs> for May 4th. Anyway, yeah, that was pretty funny. We had a good, uh, me and this other person on our team had a good uh, good time making fun of her all week. Yeah, the, the May the 4th thing bothers me just because it's, I don't know, it's like a dad joke at this point. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And... So we're, so, oh, first, before we get too far into things, I want to say a person, I want to take a personal moment here and say congratulations very much to my wonderful son, Graymar Casey, for graduating university today. Hey, congratulations. Earned his bachelor's of science in mathematics with minors in both computer science and uh, physics. And has already been accepted to grad school. Nice. He's got an internship that he'll be starting on Monday, actually. <laughs> um, that was a, quick. With a company that does modeling for energy usage. Okay. They have a software package that predicts, ener- you know, tries to predict energy usage and that kind of stuff. Sounds pretty cool. He's very excited about it and then starts grad school in the fall. So I'm, I just, I can't tell you how fucking excited and happy I am that, you know, he's, 20, 23 years old now and has already accomplished something that I never finished. I didn't, I didn't get my degree. I went to college for a while. I, I don't think I'm too far off from getting my degree, but I just never finished it. I just never went to college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't show. I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> but it sounds so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's, yeah. he's like the smartest kid I know. He's the kindest, most loving, just. Great fucking human being. I, I love that kid. So. Yeah, he's a good dude. Congratulations, he's just, son. He just got one flaw. He won't join us on this I'm show. I'm his dad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, he won't come on the show. He's he's a little well. He sat, in, he sat in here once. Yeah, he didn't. Did when he didn't when we had Russell Glasser on, he sat right there. Yeah, yeah, but he just listened though. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't want to talk on the microphone. 
but yeah, it was, it was, I'm, I'm incredibly proud and today was a good day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I did there. Well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there were certain things about today that I didn't enjoy uh, a whole yeah, lot. But yeah. You already told us about those. Yeah. Told you guys off air. It That's has fine. been a, it has been a rather <laughs> up and down fourth of let this year. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> Oh, the other thing I was going to say about the the May the 4th thing, it's, you know, I get a little bit tired of it now because it's like a worn out dad joke. And while we were waiting, this, this is the train of thought I had. I was talking about May the 4th and then it reminded me that while we were waiting for the convocation to begin today, uh, Tracy just leaned over and said, may the 4th be with you. And I was like, God damn it. Because she knows it like bothers yeah. me at this point. And I'm like, tomorrow's a much better holiday. And she's like, oh, what, the made up holiday of Cinco de Mayo? And I'm like. You just told me May the 4th, man. What the fuck? <laughs> like, you can't just say, oh, the stupid made-up holiday. She's like, well, Mexicans don't really celebrate it in America. And I'm like, fuck yeah. That's, That's a great excuse to drink tequila and eat tacos, man. We, we celebrate anything where it allows you just to get drunk for that no should reason. Be, that should be like the greatest holiday. I mean, behind St. Patrick's Day, yeah. and, and I would imagine Cinco de Mayo has a has a, a leg up on St. Patrick's Day because the weather is nicer usually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and being Irish is kind of passe anyway. Yeah. Fuck, what do you got Fuck those guys. Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, shall we get on with the rest of the shoe? Yeah. All right. So, thank you very much for coming into the studio, man. I, I was really looking forward to this interview. Um, for yeah, for right. the people who are unfamiliar, uh. You are Roy Jeffs, son of Mr. Warren Jeffs. Uh, Warren Jeffs was the, well, is the, I guess, still prophet for the Church of the, what is it, the Fundamentalist? Yeah, Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints is the kind of the the uh, the d definition of the acronym FLDS. Okay. Yeah, but it's basically they add Fundamentalist to the same title as the Mormon Church, so Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day yeah. Saints. So that's their official title. Hmm. So the Fundamentalist Church of... Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, how do they differ from the the more mainstream LDS faith? Well, so, I mean, the, the FLDS now is, is um, I wouldn't say black and white different, but it's, it's uh, vastly different from what it was 10 years ago, easily. Um, basically, kind of when my dad took over. Um, but originally like what the FLDS stood for was the, um, like the, the core teachings that Joseph Smith taught. So if you wanted to find a group that followed what Joseph Smith himself taught, um, as far as polygamy, one man rule, all of that stuff, we were pretty close other than we didn't have like the organized, um, the organized, uh, like we didn't have quorums and all of that stuff. We, you know, there, we still had like the Melchizedek, Aaronic and that, that sort the, of thing. But the different priesthoods. Yeah. We had the different priesthoods, but we didn't have, um, like, like quorums and the relief society and, and all of that stuff. But, but we, as far as teachings went, we were pretty close to the original, um, uh, doctrine of Joseph Smith. And, and the, our, our main thing was, you know, doctrine and covenants, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, that book. Um, Life of the Prophet Joseph Smith by George Buchanan, um, History of the Church. We, I mean, we knew that stuff like the back of our hand. Um, so that was primarily what we grew up on. But then when my dad took over, um, he eventually kind of morphed it into where his words and ideas kind of replaced a lot of that teaching. So he basically took the authority that Joseph Smith's teachings, you know, supposedly gave him. And then was like, okay, since I have this authority, therefore do whatever I say. And then he would add like, you know, things like don't eat onions and that stuff, <laughs> which I couldn't, I couldn't comply with. I like onions. I know I'm weird. I didn't know that like was onions. one of the things he, too. he said it, was don't was, eat onions. I, I don't know. I, I was, by the time I left, I was hearing so many things like you couldn't have any milk products, any dairy products, which I was like, screw you. Like I, I like milk, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, um, you know, and, and black pepper couldn't have black pepper um onions racist uh, it, was, it was probably just everything that gave him indigestion that's probably what i was like is he trying to get us like on a diet of prison food this is bullshit <laughs> so do you so do you think that he 
so your your father claims to be the prophet of God, of course. Yeah. As, as the head of uh, his church, of course, Joseph Smith said the same thing. Uh, more more mainstream Mormons, even though they have uh, a prophet, you know, a, a president of the church who is also prophet, seer, and revelator. Um, they don't typically refer to them by that extra long yeah. title. It's just. You know the church president said, or or the president yeah. said. They don't they don't necessarily refer to him as the prophet a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, generally they reserve that for speaking about Joseph Smith. Yeah, and and we so so uh, present prophets were the the people named them as um it was, so everybody else besides my dad's family like we called him father, um but everybody else called him Uncle Warren. So anybody that was any sort of um, had any sort of standing in the church, basically when you knew you'd, you know, sort of, you know, made it as far as being when you respect, had arrived, when you had arrived is when people started calling you uncle. So huh. it was Uncle Warren, Uncle Roy, Uncle Rulin, all of this um, uncle stuff. A lot of uncles. Um, but but are, <laughs> are they not all his nieces and nephews? No. Oh, oh okay. no. No. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe so. <laughs> no. I mean, this is. I mean, when, when my, before, before so many people left, then there was, you know, I think upwards of seven, 8,000 people there. Mm -hmm. And everybody called him Uncle Warren besides us because he was, you know, my dad. So I called him father. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we couldn't say dad or mom. Um, hmm. so, uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of how we, but, but also it was, it was either Uncle Warren or our prophet. It, but Ugh. people usually didn't say the prophet Warren's D. Jeffs unless they were like really trying to drive home a point. Hmm. Generally, I would imagine that they use that kind of language when they're speaking with an outsider or or somebody who may not really know a lot about the church or. Um, to a degree, maybe just to like initially introduce who my dad was. Like, this is who our prophet is. And then eventually after that, just out of habit, they'd say Uncle Warren um, hmm. to outsiders. So, hmm. and you were living down in Colorado City, or I'm trying to think of Short um, Creek, or I'm trying to think of yeah, they call it Short Creek. Um, Actually, it's Short Creek. There you Short go. Creek. I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm from the Midwest. It's a creek. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning how to say creek. I'm like, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's Short Creek, and we're all crickers. So back off. That sounds a no. little racist. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what we call ourselves, or call ourselves. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I mean, I was there off and on. I mean, we moved from, um, up here in Salt Lake. We moved from here down there, um, back in 1990, late 1998, I think. Okay. Um, so yeah, we moved down there and I, I, I spent some time there, but, um, eventually got shipped off to hiding. Um, so I, I spent about six and a half years there before, um, being, you know, shipped down to uh, New Mexico. So uh, that primarily that uh, from about the age of six to 12, kind I just, of grew up there. I just figured a lot of listeners might actually know about Colorado City and Shore Creek because that kind of been, it was in the news quite a bit. And that and the uh, compound in Texas, which I'm trying to think of. That's, yeah. The, so they you, it was named the YFC Ranch. Yeah. But it was an El Dorado. We, <laughs> another thing, we all, we all called it El Dorado. Everybody <laughs> in Texas was like El Dorado. Like, no, it's El Dorado. <laughs> We're from Utah. We call it Crick, and it's El Dorado. <laughs> so, <laughs> so was was the thing in Texas tied to your your father's? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was basically the utopia, or we called it Zion, mm. um, before we knew, you know, what it was. But we we were just we we called it Zion. So it's basically where the people, everybody else, was working to prove worthy to be able to go there. Hmm. Um, cause that was, you to know, be able to go to Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Which is hey, bullshit. They, hey, they, they, <laughs> these, these are people who embrace the word fundamentalist. So, <laughs> yeah. No, that was that. No, Texas is, they have, uh, the worst thing, um, that I remember was they have these, they had these, uh, bugs called, bl we call them blister beetles. I don't know what their official title was, but they, they would spray? just spray. No, but oh. basically if they touch your skin, you get blisters. Hmm. Like yeah. that's how, but they would just come by the millions. 
And we were like trying to like do unnatural things in Texas, like grow potatoes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we could never get a good crop. We could like they would they would come through there and just like go down in the ground, eat the potatoes and leave. It's like, wow. That Texas well, wasn't meant for that kind of stuff. No. no. I mean, that bug sounds like it should be in Australia where everything kills you. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> no, they were, I, I remember, we were just, the, those things were, were terrible. Like, yeah, they would, they would if you, apparently, like, if they bit you, then it was lethal, but just touching you gave you blisters. Huh. I don't know. That's what they told us. I didn't, hmm. I didn't ever bother to touch them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what, what did the, what was the view of, like, Salt Lake City Mormons from, uh, from your what do you call it? A comp? I, I mean, to me, it's like a. Well, so, so as far as what what it was, I mean, there was there was originally Short Creek or um, the you know Hilldale in Colorado City, but then my dad eventually branched out to first Colorado, then um, South Dakota, and then Texas. Mm. Um, so we were kind of in those uh, four locations primarily. Um, but the view of the view of the Mormon Church, what we were taught is. Um, the, 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 the Mormon church was, um, it was apostate and Gentile is what we were taught, but we were told that it didn't hit, it didn't become apostate and Gentile until 1978, um, when Spencer W. Kimball supposedly got a revelation okay. allowing, um, black people to come into the church. Interesting. Mm. African Americans to become members. And, and once that, then my dad, um, well, Uncle Roy actually, who was my, the prophet, before my grandpa, um, he 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 came out and said like it's over for the LDS Church. Let me see if I can do an interpretation here. So Gentile in most of the world will mean would mean Jew or non-Jew, but is what you're talking about the reason why they call them apostates and Gentiles because when you get your patriarchal blessing and you're you're given the uh, branch of the tribe of Israel that you come from. They're saying that the regular Mormon church doesn't have authority to do that. Therefore, nobody is of any of the, the tribes. Well, the reason they, well, yeah. So they called it apostate and Gentile because there were people there that were originally. So, so at, at that point, like there were people that were there that were originally part of the true church and then it apostatized. But because those people that apostatized and brought people into the LDS church after that point, mm. then anybody else they had brought in after that point was Gentile. Okay. Um, and, and Gentile to us was just pretty much anywhere that anybody that wore a t-shirt. <laughs> okay. Like, you know, they didn't wear long sleeves. <laughs> okay. So it's like, you know, if you saw somebody wearing a t-shirt that came in, oh, there's Gentiles in town. Hmm. So... I'm going to go drive around there with no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a lot better now. Like there's, there's, there's a, a lot of people there with, with t-shirts and stuff. So it's, it's a lot more normal now, but. Well, well I, I don't know if we, if we discussed it, but the, so the, the primary difference between, well, I, I don't know if it's, I guess maybe you could call it the primary difference. One of the more, one of the more, um, I can't even think of the word to describe it. The, the more controversial differences between main, that that would be a good word the between mainstream LDS church and the FLDS church under your father is the the concept of temporal plural marriages yeah um so your your mother was one of how many how many wives did your dad have i think it was the last um Last count I did was 78. 78 wives. It was 78. Um, I talked to Brielle, um, and she said that it was 79. So somewhere in that ballpark, right around 78, 80 Who's Brielle? Uh, she's my dad. She was my dad's 65th wife. Ah, oh, wow. <laughs> and how many children does he have? Do you have, do you have any idea? Um, yeah. So I, th I think the last count I did, it was 49 biological. Okay. Hmm. So. So these Had other, so the other women, did he just assign them to himself or, I mean, if they, because he didn't have children with them. So. Yeah. He didn't have children with a lot of them and a lot of them were, um, he, he, you know, he would, the teaching that he would give them is that basically they were, um, being preserved or whatever till the redemption of Zion. And then like when, you know, after we all got lifted up and then, you know, set down again, then they were going to have children. 
Hmm. Um, so that was, that was what he taught us, but really, he just really didn't have the hots for that many women. He only had the hots for a few of them. <laughs> so when you, what do you mean by, by what you say it? So you, so you mentioned when you're lifted up and set back down again, what does that mean? So it, it originates from the same thing in the Bible where, where Jesus, I, I think somewhere in there, like we didn't read the Bible a lot, but I think Jesus says that, you know, the, the righteous or, or chosen or whatever are going to be lifted up. Hmm. Um, yeah. so it, it, it's kind of that. And then Joseph Smith magnified on it and, you know, tr like went into great detail about like how exactly it was going to happen and how worthy you had to be. And then that, um, that kind of progressed my dad, you know, you know, magnified it on, on it even more. And, you know, just that, that was pretty much the whole, the whole, um, motivation for everything was we want to be worthy to be lifted up. That was, you know, our whole. Um, you know, the, the end goal or, you know, my, my, my nightmares as a kid were nightmares about monsters or, or things like that. It was about, um, you know, the destructions happening, the world ending and the rest of the family being gone and, and you not being going lifted up and me not going with them. Mm. Those were my nightmares. So yeah. Being left a, behind. Being left behind. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That's. A little bit of mental torture. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. And it's hard to get out of. But yeah, it is. It yeah, is. It's and, and it's 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 a weird thing to realize that what that that's what it is. Well, I mean, I can just imagine at that age, I mean you're having those nightmares, so you're probably dwelling on everything you've done throughout that day, throughout that oh, week, yeah. throughout that month, going, Oh, is that gonna get me in trouble? Is that gonna oh, yeah. oh, I mean, is that, is God gonna be mad at me for doing that? I mean, that's I could just see that playing over and over in your head. Oh yeah, it situations. did like crazy. And and I I mean I remember dreading the day I turned eight. Because you know, eight's the age of, age of accountability mm -hmm. in, oh, the, in right. the Doctrine and Covenants, <laughs> yeah. and what we were taught is after the age of eight, then you're accountable, so you no longer have like a free pass into heaven, mm -hmm. and so you're you're fucked. So after I was eight, I was like, oh, sh that's it, like you know, I, I'm not good enough. Now. I like onions way too much. <laughs> <laughs> before before then, it was just like you know, I'm getting in, like either way. Like, nice try, Dad. Like, I'm still getting in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, so let's establish a little bit of a timeline. So who, who was the leader of the church before your father? Uh, so my, my grandpa, Ruland Jeffs, he was there for, uh, from 1986, uh, to 2002, um, before my dad. Um, and then before him, it was, uh, Uncle Roy, who I was actually named after, uh, Leroy Johnson. Um, and he was, he was the, well, at least what we were taught, he was the leader from, uh, 1948-ish, I think, somewhere around there till 1986. So it's just basically kind of the same thing the Mormon thing is, but except for, um, I think the Mormons, like, you know, do the commons consent thing. Um, we kind of, um, you know, didn't, ended up not really doing that, um, you know, sometimes they would formally and get up and do it, but if anybody challenged it, they'd like pull them aside and say, "What the fuck is your problem?" <laughs> what do you mean so, common consent? And so, in in the Mormon Church, there's a, there's a doctrine about in 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 the Doctrine and Covenants, there's the uh, doctrine about common consent. So it's basically kind of um, tries to mirror democracy a bit, where everybody votes and says, you know. I, you know, we we uphold. I uphold and affirm I, the yeah, prophet, and I uphold the prophet in. So, um, we, they, they were like, you know, they, they supposedly, they do it every once in a while. They'd be like, do you support, you know, but it was a very rare thing. They wouldn't do it if a prophet became the prophet. It was, it was more just a, a sign of loyalty than actual, like, you know, um, a democracy or democratic type, mm -hmm. um, um, process. That's what it is in the mainstream Mormon church too. Nobody ever opposes. Yeah, nobody ever opposes, which, well, yeah, which makes sense. But, um, um, but it's just, it's just like, I, I mean, I don't know. People may, like, if people opposed in there, I don't know what they would do. I think they do talk to you about it. They remove you Did from they? the meeting and okay. talk to you. I, I think that's how it works. Yeah. It became in about there. About why you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In in there, it became like if you if you dared do that. So my dad actually he ended up started doing this common. He called it common consent, where after every revelation he gave, which a lot of times, it, I mean, I remember one time it was an it was eight hours of revelations. We sat one Sunday, 
There was a small break in between, but we had to get back and listen to more revelations. And at the end of every revelation, you had to stand up, raise your right hand, and say, I accept. What does he, what does he uh, reveal during eight hours? So much bullshit. It's like so hard to, it's hard to follow. I wish I would have brought the book with me, but it's like, um, he, he's, he, he tries to talk in, in, um, like ancient biblical, uh, terms, mm. but like ancient biblical terms 2.0. So he's like, <laughs> he goes really weird into, um, so, so like if, if, you know, if he saw this drink, he'd be like, my son Roy, I, I can you know thus say at the Lord, you are condemned for um having a, a drink of alcoholic way or um of alcoholic order. He uses order and way a lot. Weird. So <clears throat> yeah, it gets really weird and it's super hard to follow. And then and then because it's super hard to follow, you're like, I'm not inspired enough. Like I can't catch on to this stuff. <laughs> I think L. Ron Hubbard and your father would have been really good friends. And Joseph Smith, he did the same thing with the Book yeah. of Mormon. Tried to well, no, like there's, I guess there's the audio recordings of L. Ron Hubbard giving his revelations from Scientology, where you'll sit there for like eight, nine, ten hours on audio tape, just talking to everybody. Yeah, or Jim, yeah. Jim Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, there's a uh, yeah, no, there's there's thousands of hours of my dad talking. Hmm. So, they, so a lot of this was was recorded. I'm. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. okay. They have recordings of everything. He's very particular about recording it. Hmm. it. Does he? I mean, I'm not. I don't want to make this sound like a bash your dad session, and that's no, not go at all. For it. Not it's not do, at all my intention. Do it all you I'm, want. I'm just <laughs> curious about these. I mean, it's not very often you get to talk to somebody who knows one of these charismatic religious cult leaders, and yeah. so is 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 he? I mean, he seems to be someone who has uh, uh, an ego. Yeah, yeah, but he, but he, 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 uh, he, uh, he has a very, he has a very good way of going about trying to make it seem like he doesn't, uh, or he, mm -hmm. he's very, he's very good at you know going out of his way to profess his humility. humility. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, he, he definitely has a very big ego, but. Um, you know, and, and, and that became more evident as he became the leader and, you know, anybody that voiced any concern or disagreement or questioned, um, anything that he said, you know, he would, you know, he would, um, remove their fan, like he'd take their families away. He'd send them away, tell them they'd lost priesthood. Um, you know, he'd take their families, marry them to other men. Um, mm. so it was, it was, it, it became, a. a some pretty pretty big consequences if you disagreed. So yes, he did have a very fragile ego, but at the same time he, you know, just he came off or or he, you know, in there, that's what it felt like as he's just super humble, but he's also, you know, but in there, we you know, there's no way I would have recognized, you know, how big of an ego he actually had mm. because I was so afraid. But Right. This is Matt Dillahoney and you're listening to the Godless Revolution. The question is, is to, to Christopher is how you can justify why you take something away from people from 95, that gives meaning to 95% of the American people and replace it with something that gives meaning to just 5% of the American people? Ha! Huh. Well, um, what an incredibly stupid question. Um, <laughs> uh, first, First, I've said repeatedly that it, this stuff cannot be taken away from people. It is their favorite toy, and it will remain so, <laughs> as, as Freud said, in the future of an illusion, it will remain that way as long as we're afraid of death and have no problem, which is, I think, likely to be quite a long time. Second, I hope I've made it clear <clears throat> that I'm perfectly happy for people to, to have these toys and to play with them at home and hug them to themselves and so on and share them with other people who come around and play with the toys. So that's absolutely fine. They are not to make me play with these toys. Okay? I will not play with the toys. Don't bring the toys to my house. Don't say, my children must play with these toys. Don't say, my toys might be a condom. Here we go again. I'm not allowed by their toys. I'm not going to have any of that. Enough with clerical and religious bullying and intimidation. Is that finally clear? Have I got that across? Thank you. Rejoining the Godless Revolution podcast now. Now, I've always heard this 
rumor or I don't know if it's considered a conspiracy theory through some of the other documentaries I've watched on the FLDS groups and everything saying that they think that Warren actually killed Rulin so he could take over the church when Rulin was on his deathbed. And I've, I've heard that too, but, um, that, I mean, this, um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty skeptical person. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, you know, there's, um, seed bearer rumors and a lot of stuff that I've heard, but, um, that it just lacks evidence. So I, I don't know that that's what happened. I didn't know if that would, um, would have been a rumor that I, was ever going around. Like, oh, it wasn't going around in there. Okay. Oh, by, by no means. That's something I've, as far as rumors go, that's something I heard after I came okay. out that they, you know, said, you know, this is what we think happened, but I have no evidence that that's, that was the case. Hmm. Um, you know, although it would have been super easy to do because my dad was just, he was, he was, you know, incapable of doing anything. Or, I'm sorry, not my dad, my grandpa. <laughs> okay. My grandpa, he was like 93, I think. Yeah. And, and that, that's kind of the walk. Like, he can do anything. The, so. the rumor I heard basically that Warren was sick and tired of waiting for him to pass to away. Pass. And just he was like, I patient. want, he's like, I, I want to take over this church. I want you to die. So that way I can just, yeah, I can be in charge. Yeah. It, it, it would, it would have been very easy to do. And, um, obviously would seem likely from an outs- outside perspective. Uh, but it's something I don't know if actually ever happened. And, you know, obviously I'm sure he would never want anybody to know if that yeah, was the case. Yeah. <laughs> so within the, within the LDS church, there's a line of succession, right? The, right. That whoever is just below the president is the next one to become president. Is there any such thing in the FLDS church? Like, is there a, is there a hierarchy? Because it kind of sounds like your dad was just this despotic dictator who, who ran everything himself. Did he have, underlings did did he have like a a quorum or a presidency or anything like that yeah well he had a presidency and that's kind of how he became um the next prophet was because he was the first first counselor and um so like i said we didn't really have quorums we didn't eventually um you know late 1980s 1990s we didn't have apostles mm-hmm. um so it, it it just it just came to a point where the only um, quorum we had was the quorum of the first presidency. And basically, uh, you know, in my lifetime, it was whoever was the, you know, generally it was whoever the, was the first counselor then became the prophet, which, you know, that only happened the one time mm-hmm. from my grandpa to my dad. Um, but before that, I mean, for, I mean, back, I don't know, back to the early 1900s, they always had, you know, between six and ten, and they were always trying to get to twelve apostles. Um, so there was like <laughs> still, still looking yeah, for that other. Still half looking. Dozen they to... had to be like worthy, and I don't know what. Yeah, check what every strip the... club. Yeah, no, no kidding. <laughs> hey, my dad was good at that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was just joking there. I didn't know that was no. actually going to lead somewhere. <laughs> no, he he was the the. Uh, I, th- I think he was actually down in uh, uh, New Orleans at some of those strip clubs in in uh, uh, right before Hurricane Katrina because oh. he came back and he said that um, he was there just before Hurricane Katrina okay. and the only reason it happened was because he turned the city over to Satan. He so, turned the city wow. over to Satan. How nice. He cursed the city. Yeah. So he was like, you know, like soaking in the glory for it in on our side of it. But I mean, yeah. like you read his, you read his diary or his, his, uh, he called it a sacred record. Um, but you read that now and like he was, you know, going to strip clubs, um, you know, having orgies, going to wow. movies, whatever. You know, so he was, so. he was apparently self aware enough. That he like wrote this stuff down. He wasn't, he wasn't completely, he hadn't deluded himself to the point of the level that he wanted to delude the rest of his followers, right? So he's writing this stuff down. He didn't, he didn't in his own mind have this pure and white and delightsome view of himself. He <laughs> knew the things he was doing. Um, yeah, on, on, from my perspective, there had to have been some point where he consciously made a decision to keep going after he realized what, how wrong everything was that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but he needed a constant reassurance of people that, you know, we worshiped him and he needed that reassurance in order to convince himself that he was doing right. Um, and then I've seen kind of the same cycle in prison where he goes through, you know, like I'm guilty, I've done terrible things. And then, you know, the people that are most loyal, they don't tell anybody that he said that 
they go back and they're like, this is a test, reassure him, tell him he's perfect. And then, oh. um, and then, you know, he's like all high and mighty again. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, so it just kind of feeds yeah. on itself. It sounds yeah, like, yeah, uh, it's, that's, that's what it, it, it appears to be to me. Um, cause, I mean, like he, he won't allow anybody that talks, um, you know, that would talk straight with him. He won't talk to anybody that would do that. Um, you know, when he gets, you know, he's in court or gets in, you know, deposition or whatever, he just sits there. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth on everything. And so it's like, dang. So he Hmm. won't do an interview with us? No. (laughs) Hell no. (laughs) It'd be hard to do that. The Lord says no. (laughs) Well, it'd be hard to do that anyway because he is in prison. Um, what was he ultimately convicted and sentenced for? Um, so I think he was convicted on two counts. Um, and I think, I think one of them may have been aggra- aggravated as a uh, sexual assault of a minor. Hmm. Um, and then another one was just like sexual assault. I think it, I think there was two. I'd have to look it up again to find out, um, exactly what it was, but he's, he's in there for life. So yeah, that's, that's good. Hmm. Yeah. And that was, that was because he had taken, child brides what would how old was his youngest wife the youngest one and the one he actually went to prison for was um late 11 going on 12 oh my Jesus. so yeah, yeah i remember showing up right after he um, married her and i was just like holy cow like but my yeah, my young mind i was i was fine with it because you know girls in the house is you know i'm, I'm good with that but yeah um but you know now i'm just like that's that's despicable and just disgusting. Yeah. So. Well, so let's let's move away from talking about your dad a little bit and yeah. talk more about you. What what were some of your earliest memories uh, growing up and and being? Do do you refer to it to crickers as as cultists? I mean, do you do you view it <laughs> yeah, as a cult now? Yeah, or? it's definitely a cult. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's definitely a cult. Um. But I mean, up until I was about ten years old. It was pretty normal, like uh, as far as a, a polygamous family could be. Like you know, we had a structured, um, you know, house. We didn't, we didn't. I mean, we worked um, in the summer during the winter and stuff. We went to school just like the normal school season. Um, but you know, it was you know we had a structured. You know, we got up every morning, went to family prayer, and um, you know, went to school, did our schoolwork, came home. You know, some, you know, had chores, um, um, just, it was a pretty routine, um, normal life up until I was about 10, 11 years old. And that's when my dad took over and kind of upset everything. Um, but I mean, like I, I recently went down to, uh, went down to my, uh, childhood home. Um, well, one of my childhood homes, I guess, cause it was mm-hmm. from about the age of six to 12. Went down and walked through that thing, and it was just kind of a, a amazing to me, like seeing that place and um, you know, going back through everything that happened there because there was a lot of good stuff there, um, and especially with my mom, I had a lot of good memories with her. Um, so, um, growing growing up there, um, I don't know. I mean, I was a I was a pretty hyper kid, um, um, ha- a pretty happy kid too. Um, and that kind of all changed, um, around the ages of uh, 11 or 12. Um, but growing up uh, from up till about the age of 10, you know, it was, we, we had, um, I mean, we, we celebrated some holidays. I mean, we celebrated say July 4th, July 24th. Um, we celebrated, uh, Gosh, I'm trying to think. We had like a like a. I was gonna say for those right now, I was gonna say for those outside of Utah, July 24th is Pioneers Day here in Utah. Yeah, so it's a it's a well known uh, LDS uh, or, or Utah state holiday. Yeah, so um, yeah, we 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 spent um, a lot of or we spent uh, holidays like that. Um, prophets' birthdays were always um, holidays or. Um, like the current prophet or, or current going prophet back, like... or not, not all of the prophets, um, uncle Roy's basically prophets that have, that had been there or, you know, had, had lived in that town kind of, cause that, that whole um, movement down there didn't really start till the 19, 
um, 30s, 40s. And mm. so it was, it was like Uncle Roy's birthday, um, my grandpa's birthday. So it wasn't any any of like the the um, prophets in like the 19th century. Um, any any of like like ancient like you know Jesus you know we we celebrated Jesus's birthday on April 6th. Oh, and instead of like celebrating by eating, we celebrated by fasting. Mm. <laughs> That's that shit. Sucks. That's yeah. crap. <laughs> it's like here's a holiday. Don't eat anything. No kidding. I was like, I God, I hate juice. <laughs> <laughs> if only we could have had alcohol. Um, but no, but it was it was good. I mean, we had we had um, park days. We had we played games. Um, you know, there there was some good good experiences growing up for sure. Up until about the age of ten, eleven. So. Well, so what happened around the age of 10 or 11? So it was when my, my dad finally, or when he took over, it was about 2002. I was 10 years old. Um, and things just kind of went downhill from there. Um, you know, he started, you know, saying anything. I think it was, I think by 2004, he had eliminated all toys. Um, so we had, you know, with that big of a family, had a ton of bikes. Yeah. And um and our family particularly was just very heavy into sports. Um so um and and my dad had like a, a basketball court made for him and um everything and we you know it, um we did a lot of rollerblading, um you know, dodgeball, tons of stuff. So we had to like throw all that stuff away um and it was just became you need to work. Um, so it became, you need to, you need to turn, you need to change yourself to where work is fun and play is bad. Wow. Well, I was going to say, Hmm. like, you know, was there a cutoff of what he considered a toy and and what wasn't a toy, but it sounds like, well, because you can turn a stick into a toy, right? As as a kid. So, which we did, (laughs) which we did. So would you get in trouble for that? Like put that stick no, slash toy down. No, because it was a tool. They would just tell us to quit playing around, but they wouldn't uh. say put that toy away because it was a tool. Yeah. Um. Hmm. But no, we, I mean, you know, being down in Texas, you know, we'd, they'd, they'd figure all, all kinds of things to do to, to play around um, down there too. And um, yeah, you, you, you like with, with kids, you can't get like, at some point they just want to, you know, release some energy. So yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you just had to get creative if you wanted to play Put those around. little bastards to work, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like down in Texas, I remember we'd like, you know, just chase deer with ATVs just cause we could. <laughs> just cause we could. We'd like, you know, get them cornered and then shit our pants when they could attack us. So it's, <laughs> so it's like. <laughs> well, I, I admit to doing the same thing in Texas, but I was drunk. <laughs> and not on an ATV, and I was chasing a deer through a parking lot on a military base. <laughs> I wish I could have been. <laughs> uh, so, and and I've listened to uh, a lot of the other interviews you've done. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the work was centered around either farming or construction. Yes, and construction um, was because we needed to learn how to build and perfect our building talents. So that when we went back to Jackson County, Missouri, then we would, you know, be pros and be, oh, and so we would basically, because we were of the blood of Ephraim, so we were going to um, teach the other tribes of Israel. I clearly forgot that those guys were going to be coming back sometime, like, (laughs) (laughs) they were supposed to come like. Like any day now. (laughs) Well, they were supposed to like come and, oh, they were supposed to land up by Alaska. That's what Ah. it was. Up there, up there in the, like, up by Alaska, they were supposed to come land up well, there. Well, they could have, because there's a lot of parts of Alaska that are just very rugged and wilderness. They were, they're they probably just, there already. Yeah, Who knows? they could be stuck out in the woods <laughs> trying to defend themselves from a bear. They're still walking. They're well, just, like, so, on their way. Yeah, so, they're supposed to land there? Like. Yeah. Well, no, they're supposed to come land in the ocean there, like a whole, oh. a whole chunk of the planet. So, supposedly, they left, went across Asia. Went up all of the the tribes of Egypt or, or the the tribes of Israel besides Ephraim went or half of the tribe of Ephraim came up there and then they were like taken into heaven like Enoch in his city. Hmm. Um, so kind hmm. of the same scenario except for they're um like not perfect. So Enoch and his city is perfect. Tribes of Israel not so much. Well, yeah, he, he chose one of the coldest bodies of water to land in. 
Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what? So what in the FLDS is the significance of Jackson County, Missouri? Why would you need to get prepared to go there? Well, because that's the that's supposedly that's where the Garden of Eden was, and so that's why um, the Lord chose it as the site for the temple. Is kind of the I don't know. I'm not familiar if the Mormons believe that. They, too, yeah, they but, do. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's kind of that same mentality, but. Um, yeah, it's it's where the Garden of Eden was and where it will be. As anyone who's driven through Missouri knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that gorgeous, luxurious landscape. Yeah, just don't go there in the winter. That's bullshit. <laughs> it's horrible. Absolutely horrible. Well, you don't like the Midwest in the winter? No, oh, I, actually, I, I don't. When you get doing construction out there and you don't have um, um, really any protection, um, you know, it's it's horrible. <laughs> you just need a man up. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so your your father takes over the church uh, when you're around 11 or 12. You say things start to go downhill. You guys start doing construction work and just farming and everything. Does all of the community just readily accept this as this is the word from the prophet? Is there some grumbling? I'm sure the kids weren't entirely happy about it. Did you, did you pick up on... Any of the adults expressing some dissent with what was going on? Well, so that primarily happened um, with what was going on in Texas. So the people in Colorado City didn't go through that um, until mm. until years later. And what my dad would do is he would put the family through it. And, you know, sometimes like people in Texas or the other lands of refuge is what he called them. Um, he would put them through it first and then, you know, eventually years down the road, he put the rest of the people through it. Um, so, you know, he, he, he had us get rid of our toys and stuff in 2004. He did the same thing down in Texas. Um, but he didn't have everybody do that until, I don't know, 2011 in Colorado city. He didn't have it. So, so he'd run us through it first. Then he would, um, and I don't know if it was just kind of as a test run. You know, he he took the, the children away from their mothers first. He 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 put us through everything first, and then did the rest of the people. That yeah, hmm. sounds like you guys are beta testers. Yeah, we kind of were. We're kind of the guinea pigs for everything. Yeah, basically, see, hey, are they going to follow suit with this? Well, will they go along with yeah. it? Oh, they went along with it. Everybody else will go along with it. That's yeah, kind of what it, it took like it took a, a lot bit. of indoctrination, but no, it didn't just happen overnight. Um, it it took a lot. It took a lot for him to get the rest of the people to do it. So yeah, it was a. It was a why whole do indoctrination process? Yeah, I mean, is that is that all it is? That's why people, because I mean, it sounds like he. I mean, it's on top of just like turning everything upside down and shaking it. A um, lot of sort of unpleasant new policies, new revelations that he's you know no toys, you know moving separating families. He's like a proto ice agent. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No. Uh, it why was... do people do? Why did people do it? Why do <laughs> well, they... it was. Uh... I mean, ultimately, what what it was was definitely mind control, but it was just kind of in a an, an indoctrination. It was just kind of a, that was kind of the first step that he had to do. Um, I remember, you know, the the one of the first things is he was like, "Don't play dodgeball anymore because you're like hitting people, oh. and we don't like violence, mm. so you're hitting people." Um, so it was mm. stuff like that. And then it was like, you can't, you know, play games because they're games, games are of the world. Um, so we can't have anything that's of the so world. So are potatoes. Yeah. Unless you home grow. <laughs> 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 no. And, and he was getting to that where he was like, he wanted everything homemade, like everything down mm. to our e even your tools and the lumber you used. Yeah. That, holy cow. Like all of the holy houses shit. down there was stuff that was um, brought from Canada by priested companies. Oh, wow. So. Holy shit. Yeah. That's... So he was, he was very particular about where stuff came from. Mm -hmm. um, and he was trying to get to a point where all of that, everything was homemade. Everything was, um, you know, um, he, he became super, super particular about being separated from the world and everything that he was doing was a step in this direction of um n not ever having pleasure like by the time i left i remember like if you laughed out loud by the time i left it was like people would turn their heads and be like what's your problem hmm. um it's like quakers almost yeah but it was it was just like it it just kind of just a really depressing environment is what it, it eventually became 
at least by the time I left, but it took a lot to get there. And it had to start with, you know, removing like just simple pleasures and, you know, stuff like that, where you just entertain yourself, anything for entertainment. Hmm. I mean, I remember him saying you can't have videos, not like, not like a movie or anything, just like a video, like take a video. Oh, you can't watch that. Get rid of it. Oh, wow. Hmm. So any, anything like that. What would people take video with down there? Did, I mean, it's my understanding that there wasn't a lot of technology available to people. Like you couldn't watch TV. You couldn't listen to the radio. Uh, did they have mobile phones or uh, just what? There what? was some mobile phones, um, but it was more, we didn't, we didn't have any sort of entertainment as far as outside entertainment, but we had, um, like, yeah, we had iPods. I think it got to a point where he was like, um, get rid of anything electronic. Hmm. I remember being, I think I was like 20, 21. And he was like, get rid of, um, like a, an iPod. And I'm like, why? Like, what, what bad thing am I going to do? Like, I don't even have a computer. Like, this is the an old iPods. Hmm. This wasn't like, I'm just like, what bad thing am I going to do with this? And. Um, it never made sense to me. Um, it actually kind of pissed me off, but yeah, <laughs> sure. it took a and long time. That to was start the getting... start of everything yeah. for you getting up. <laughs> yeah, that was the start of everything for a much better life. <laughs> how, how, yeah. does, how does anyone get anything? I mean, is, do people have incomes? Is there any money? I mean, I can't imagine he would allow that kind of. Well, so now, now it may be much different now, but, um, what the way he was he was doing it um when i left um so so they owned um basically they owned these several construction companies mm. and basically you you turned in all of your money or you know a ma major portion of it and basically they funded all these people that weren't living or that were living on the church by all of these other people that were donating all of their income or or these companies would donate a lot of money um, uh, but, and, but they would only pay their employees minimum wage. And this is like, you know, journeyman electricians, project mm -hmm. managers, all these guys getting paid, you know, minimum wage or barely above. So it's, you know, hmm. socialism. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. It, it was, it was, uh, I, I mean, I don't really know how to, what, how to define socialism. I don't even know. Yeah. I was just the, being, yeah, I was being dumb. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people say that. And I remember when I first heard. Of socialism, I was like, oh, yeah, these guys are just trying to, like, make the United Order. And I'm like, <laughs> screw that. <laughs> so you can't have toys. You can't have videos. You're working all the time. How many brothers and sisters have you got just in, in your immediate biological family? You mean by my mother? Yes. By your mother and father. Well, by my father, there's there's forty nine total. Well, I but in so your father and your mother combined, how many how many children? Oh, four, four. Okay, yeah, and you could tell by you could tell which ones which wives he liked by how many children he would have with them. So apparently, he told what my sister told me is that he said back in nineteen ninety eight ninety nine when she had her last kid, um, that she was no longer worthy to have children, and so he she she only had four. Um, but you know, the, the wives that he liked would have, you know, 10 or more or whatever. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't, uh, my, my mom didn't have a lot of, you know, kids, which I'm fine with. But. <laughs> <laughs> and are your other siblings, so are, are your other siblings from your mother? Are they all still in? Yeah. Yeah. Are they're they? all, they're all still in there from my understanding. Um, I have a few half siblings that are out here, um, but as far as my immediate siblings, they're all still in. So, do you still have communications with them? Or no, no. They they like I was I was the first one of my dad's kids to leave, and so I kind of broke the ice for the family. But at the same at the same uh, the same time, it was it was when I, when I chose to leave, it was it was a uh, it was a conscious decision to never see them again, ever. 
Mm-hmm. And I didn't like. I was shocked when I found out that some of my half siblings um, had left. Well, and you because I mean, when you're on the inside, you know that's the consequence of leaving. Yeah, is that nobody will ever speak to you again, right? Yeah, and and they'll literally disown you. Like my dad called around to the rest of the family and said, um, "Roy is no longer my son, and don't call him brother. Don't call him, you know, son." Um, so it's a it's a it's a very um, clean cut. Just they disown you fully. Is I mean that's got to be a miserable transition. Like oh, it's, I mean you're is. totally isolated. Then like who do you? I mean who do you even have now? Um, well, not, not that I'm trying to get personal. <laughs> no, but I'm no. just saying like as a rhetor- I'm just thinking as a rhetorically like what how what would that be like? I mean what what is what is your trans what has your or transition just, been like? I mean what is well it? it's it's very terrifying. Um, at first, um, I was fortunate enough to um get in touch with a nonprofit out here that um helps people um and and i'm a i'm a kind of guy like i don't like um i don't like uh, uh freebies like i don't like people mm-hmm. giving me free stuff so i tried to get in you know on my feet as soon as i could and you know they helped me with like some some gas in my tank um mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that a few times but um i was fortunate enough to be able to um you know be helped by them um but it's it's uh I don't know. It's it's been quite a process. Um and it's it's um I I've kind of just had to um become okay with not become okay with not um requiring a massive social circle or social support. Mm. Like I have, you know, I have you know therapist and but I don't have a lot of like close friends or anything like that. But it's just kind of a process. Like it's it's taken me a few years to get there. Um, but it's a it's a um, I don't know. It's just it's kind of a, where I just have to start looking at myself and being like, okay, what's best for me? Um, you know what what do I need to do to um, you know make make my life better? And also being let down a lot um, just makes you not trust pretty much everybody (laughs) sure so it's really hard to let people like i've had a lot of people try to get in my life and it's just like you know i i i'm uh it's it's much what what are their motives it's what what are their motives but it's just much safer just because of what's you know stuff that's happened to me um so it's it just becomes much safer to um just you know try and feel like it's cool to be alone even though it's fucking lonely (laughs) i'm getting there i'm trying to build a social circle (laughs) hi this is justin schieber formerly of the reasonable doubts podcast and currently of real a theology and you are listening to the godless revolution so I changed my theology a thousand times. I mean, by the time I, but the the last God I believed in, Seth, was the greatest God in the world. He was so wonderful. <laughs> he agreed with everything I cared about. He was so nice. He wasn't sending anybody to hell. He wasn't responsible for any evil thing. And the problem is, is that like I was in love with that God until I realized, of course, like if God and you agree that much, it's maybe because you invented him. You and the Godless Revolution will be reassimilated in three, two, one. Well, that's that's kind of how you and I got in touch. Um, that's true. Uh, the fabulous Lindsay Hansen Park. For anybody, for anybody who is interested in in Mormonism or anything, Lindsay has her own podcast uh, called uh, Year of Polygamy. Yeah, she's been doing it for more than a year now, but. So maybe she want to <laughs> adjust the title. I don't know, but she does a great job. Um, I know she does a lot of help and outreach and support for people uh, leaving both traditional or mainstream Mormonism and people leaving uh, the FLDS church and stuff. Um, and she had contacted me because, uh, you know, she contacted me out of the blue. Apparently she was down at your old home with you doing some, doing some work. And you had mentioned that you're now an atheist and you were having a, a difficult time finding a- other atheists around and everything. And she's like, oh, I know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, immediately off the bat, she's like, hey, I know somebody. Yeah. Yeah, so she's awesome. And and you, you had a great two-part interview on her show. I would recommend that everybody go check that out also. Um, so what were you guys doing down there? Um, I, I've seen some video where you 
tried your first Diet Coke, which <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if you liked it or not, but that is not at, by any means the best soda no, available. No, it's not. <laughs> Dr. Pepper. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, so I, I recently became quite addicted to grape soda. Oh, yeah? I don't know why. Grape soda is good. Everybody at work thinks I'm crazy a little bit, but <laughs> I'm like, I don't really give a crap. <laughs> grape soda is kind of my thing now. Which grape soda? Fanta. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, the I, good stuff. I, mm-hmm. I make sure they buy that special for me. So <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of my thing. Um, no, we were. Um, so I, I didn't. You know, I was, I was going through a little bit of stuff, and you know, talking to Lindsay, and she was just like, "Well, come down here." So I was just like, "Okay, what the heck?" Um, so I drove down there, and um, you know, found out it was like a service project. So. Um, they were, they were, they were trying to change the old zoo into a, uh, into a nature center, apparently. The old zoo. So there used to be as, well, it's, it's still there, but it's just doesn't have any animals in it. Uh-huh. But, um, it was a, it was a functional zoo. Zebras know, got outlawed as well. Oh, within, yeah. within the. In the town. Yeah. Oh, wow. We had, hmm. there was, there was a ton of stuff, like a lot of, there was a lot of exotic, um, animals. They were, before it got shut down, they were just about to get a giraffe. Um, huh. They had, you know, they had camels, they had, I mean, there's even still, like while we were down there, mm. there's emus everywhere or two, actually two <laughs> emus. And they're just, they're super friendly though. They like come up and eat out of your hand okay. and um, they were like roaming around, you know, as we were working and they probably ate all the flowers they planted, but <laughs> <whatever>. <laughs> so there's still a few remnants of, of animals there, but they're tr- tr- trying to tr- change that into a uh, nature center. Um, so I was down there, um, down there working with them doing that and, you know, took some, they were staying at my dad's old house down there. Um, so, um, I took, you know, I don't know, about 20 to 30 people on a tour through that place, um, which was pretty surreal going through that. It was very, I bet. yeah, it was, it was, it was really weird seeing, you know, um, you know, experiencing everything, like going back through all the feelings of positive fun times we had there and then just really shitty times that we had there. So, um, no, that was really, uh, a, a really quite a therapeutic experience for me. Um, but went and spent the weekend down there with Lindsay and, um, very needed, but yeah. So how does that work now with your, your father is still the head of the church, even from prison. Um, how do, how do things run there day to day and who, like, is there anybody that would have told you, no, you can't come in here. This is the prophet's well, home. Well, so the UEP, the the United Effort Plan Trust, um, owns all of the land or did. And so basically they've been because because the church has um, we we refused to pay occupancy fees to the trust um, and, and taxes and stuff. Well, I, no, I think we paid taxes. We just didn't pay the occupancy fees or something. I have no, I, I don't, I don't know all the details of that. Um, but because basically we were told that we shouldn't because we owned this land. It was the church's land and it was wrong. Um, it, it was, uh, we, we were going against God to give money to the trust, even though the trust owned the land we were living on. And basically they just kind of, kind of ran up their tab so high until the trust was like, okay, you got to pay up. And so they've been evicting a lot of people, which is, it, it, it really sucks because, you know, they're putting a lot of women and children out on the street, um, in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of situations. Um, but you know, from the trust point of view, I don't know what else they would do. Um, because, you know, basically they're going against God or their religion to, um, pay the money. But at the same time, it's, you know, you know, they got to pay, somebody's got to pay the money. Um, so basically that's what happened with my dad's old house is they evicted him, um, evicted, um, whoever was living there. I don't know, um, who it was at the time, but. Hmm. So you just, it's just it's sitting just empty sitting now. There. Yeah, yeah. It's just sitting there empty. I think they had a temporary occupation permit or something. So that's how we were able to stay there for the weekend. But well it's huge, right? How how many rooms does that home have? I think it has forty two. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh it's like I went in I was like, man, this is small when I went in there. <laughs> well it felt it felt really small because as a kid yeah, I was just right. like 
this is awesome. Like I remember it's, running it's a, down the mansion. halls and I mean, we weren't supposed to run in the house. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the house was dedicated, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, but I just remember that just being like, wow, this is huge as a kid. But I walked in there and I was just like, holy cow, this is so tiny. Hmm. So it was, it was, um, I don't know. But, Another slightly off question. You don't have to answer if you don't want. I'm just curious if it. you have any idea what his net, net worth would have been like around the time of his imprisonment or whatever before. Well, so nothing was attributed to his name specifically, oh, okay. no, but, but the amount of money that he blew through, um, in, in building, um, in building the, the ranch in Texas and building all of the other lands of refuge. Well, I'm building um, the giant temple too, right? Yeah. Well, that thing, that thing, the, the land itself now is worth about 20 million, but, Ooh. um, the, the amount of man hours that went into yeah. that, um, everything easy, easily up around 500 million. Holy shit. <laughs> with with everything that they put into that as far as just expenses and fuel and power mm. and um you know they had these these massive electric saws that they cut all of that stone with mm. oh, running yeah. 24/7 huge motors and I'm huge motors cutting through solid rock 24/7 mm. wow. for a straight year um stuff like that just just yeah s- huge expenses Wow. Um, easily, easily upwards of 500 million, I I'm, I'm, would assume. That's insane. Hmm. So you said that your, your other siblings are still in the, are still, are still in the cult. Yeah. Uh, I would assume your mother is as well. Yeah. She's, so my dad, um, I, I started to voice my questions or my, um, I, I started to voice how I was feeling, like I was thinking about leaving or tempted to leave um, a couple of years before I left. And so around that point, my dad cut communication off between me and my mom. Um, so I didn't talk to her for about two years before I left and haven't talked to her since. So it's been about, about five-ish years, somewhere around there, since I've seen her talk to her. Um, well, actually, about five and a half since I've seen her, um, five since I talked to her. Um, but yeah, I have no idea where she is and it would be awesome to find out. But, and I've, I've talked with some people. Like you have no idea where she is at all? I have, I mean, I can, I, I can assume maybe she's in Colorado somewhere or Wyoming, somewhere where they tend to have houses in hiding. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Um, at the same time, you know, I've heard rumors they're, you know, m- branching out to other states, branching out to Mexico. So I don't, I have no clue. Um, and it would be, yeah, it would be, and I've, I've talked about, you know, seeing if I could round up some funding to go find her, but at the same time, it was just be like, you know, if, if I find her, the best thing I could do, if she didn't want anything to do with me is give her my phone number, mm-hmm. you know, and whatever, you know, I. I got to pay for my living and expenses and in life just to exist. So it's like, you know, it, it's kind of on her terms whenever she's ready. Yeah. Well, from, yeah. from everything that I've gathered uh, in, in listening to your other interviews and, and watching your other interviews, it sounds like you were pretty close with your mother. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's, I, I imagine that's got to be something that, that you think about on a regular basis and that's, you know, been difficult as you have transitioned out of the cult is just being cut off from her. And like you said, not even really even knowing where she is. Yeah, it it is. And it's, it's kind of a black hole because there's, you know, there's been situations where people have got sick in there and my dad has, you know, told them that's their punishment or, um, you know, refused, you refused care, wouldn't let them go to the hospital, you know, and I'm talking like cancer, stuff like that. So I, I'm always deathly afraid that something like that would happen to her, and I have to just kind of not think about it in order to make it through the day. But um, no, I, it's it's definitely it's definitely a, a a worry of mine. But yes, we were we were I was very close to her, and I was fortunate more fortunate than a lot of the um, a lot of my other siblings because my dad would usually pull them away from their birth mother, put them with other wives, and then. Um, you know, they would raise them and my, you know, kind of didn't really, so, so the, the birth mother didn't really have as close of a relationship as, mm-hmm. and I think he did that quite intentionally, um, because that, that, you know, allowed, 
n- you know, not allowing kids to have that um, allowed, you know, him to be able to, you know, kind of push, you know, be the puppeteer, I guess, um, without, yeah. without any sort of, um, emotional, con- emotional consequences or whatever. Um, you know, even though there were, they just weren't as big. Um, hmm. but for me, it was, it was a huge deal. You know, he took me away from her at the age of 14, um, moved me up to a ranch in Wyoming out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and that was really hard. I mean, I remember crying for days, um, trying to, trying to, um, you know, just wish, you know, trying to want to be around my mom, but, um, yeah, it was, it, I, I was, I spent a lot of time. I was in hiding with her. Um, it got to where it was just me and her and we worked together all the time. Um, I, I don't know. It was, I was more fortunate than most of the other kids to be able to, um, you know, go through a lot with her and, um, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, like, um, a tough subject. I don't know. My, my mom, um, you know, miss her like crazy, but, um, yeah, she was, she was, uh, absolutely amazing and everything good, pretty much everything good I ever learned as far as discipline or manners or, um, anything like that, I definitely attribute to her because my dad wasn't there ever, um, you know, I only learned a few things from him, but so, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sure that's incredibly difficult. I can't imagine how that would be. You know, I, my mom lives, you know, three and a half miles yeah. from my home here and I don't talk to her as much as I should, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> well, I'm thinking that all the time. I'm like, yeah. I should have said something more. <laughs> but I, I should have. Um, no, it's, it's more just the uncertainty mm, of not yeah. knowing like if she's okay or like, like, uh, in a, in a weird twisted way, it, you know, to me, it would feel better to know, like, if she was dead, like that would be more than to just have it wide open yeah. than to just have it wide open being yeah. like, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Absolutely no idea. Yeah. Human brains don't like that. Yeah. The, the unknown. Yeah. When it's yeah. just out there floating yeah. and you know. Yeah, it's one of the, yeah it's miserable. It's, it's, yeah, it's 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 super miserable. <laughs> so, mm. it, would your father exercise punishment? So, it, I know that they're, um, they're you know when when your father would either kick young men out of the community or they would choose to leave or whatever. There's a there's a fairly large number of uh, young males who have left that. Uh, have often been re- referred to as the lost boys who, you know, leave Short Creek. They travel up to Salt Lake City, try to, you know, they they associate with each other. They live in apartments together sometimes for support. Um, is there, would your father ever punish the remaining family members if if somebody chose to leave or was kicked out? Would he also then punish the, the people who, who remained? I mean, is that is that a concern for you that you're leaving would have carried with it some type of punishment for anybody else in your family. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's a huge concern because, and and I know it happened because I I saw it happen a lot um, where it was like, because what, what, what we were taught is, is that if a child leaves, blame their parents, their parents screwed up somehow. Didn't raise them right. Yeah. Didn't raise somewhere in there. They, they fucked up. So Mm -hmm. it's like, so I know that that's what my dad was saying to my mom and that's what hurt. And I didn't, that's part of me. Like when I left, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this because I know what my dad's going to say to my mom and I don't want her to hurt because of what I did, even though I know that's what happened. But, you know, I, you know, eventually had to make that choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely, definitely, um, it's more, it isn't so much toward the family as it is toward the parent or, you know, it, and it's funny cause it's like, okay, but you were my parent But yeah, too. I was going to say, well, fuck so, you, dad, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> you fucked up somewhere too. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, I didn't really think of that until somebody had brought that up to me. I was like, oh, that's right. He is my dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I kind of distanced myself. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine having to live that kind of life. You said that you went into hiding when you were younger. What what was that all about? So, for some reason my dad was telling us 
Some reason my dad was telling us that um, the the government was after us, that the uh, his enemies were after him. Who those were or why they were after him, we had no idea. But we were just told that they were after us. And so, and and eventually they were, you know, with, you know, they put him on the Well, FBI's. after him, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they were after him, but um, basically they were like, they're after me, but they want you so they can get to me. So basically that's why uh, he had us in hiding. Um, so I was 13, I th- no, 12. When I was 12 is when he um, shipped us from, shipped us from Colorado City down to uh, uh, Albuquerque. New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we lived in a, in a subdivision, you know, but the houses were, you know, 10, 12 feet apart and we couldn't open the blinds. We couldn't do anything like that. We, you know, I remember, you know, we, we sat there for, you know, 30 days like that with just the, the house just blacked out pretty much. And like, like a witness protection program that you put yourself into. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Except for you couldn't leave the house, you yeah. couldn't do anything like that, and um, and eventually he was like, okay, you can go get some exercise. But basically, what we had to do is is the the vehicle we were in had to have blacked out tint, and we would get into it in the garage. They'd take us outside the city, up in the mountain. We get out, walk around, and then get back in the car, oh. come home. Hmm. Um, so th- lived in that kind of a situation for about a year. Then eventually, we found a house outside the city. Um, where we were able to go outside the house more. Um, but, um, yeah, that was, that was, uh, my, and my mom was there through the whole thing. And that was kind of my, um, experience of isolation because I was, um, I didn't have any other siblings there. Um, so it was just me and my mom and some of my dad's other wives. Um, and eventually it just became me and my mom. But, um, no, we spent, um, a lot of time absolutely paranoid totally paranoid that something like that somebody was going to recognize us and Hmm. i don't know it was a it was a very suspenseful time but it's like suspenseful for no reason (laughs) fear (laughs) tactics yeah yeah it it is very much a fear tactic because now it's i'm just like well fuck you i'm not going to hiding like that's my (laughs) my feeling now but back then it's like you know you didn't have a choice yeah well these you, you say these you you had a home where you went and you had to stay and it was blacked out. Who owns the home? Like where does this well, property so it, come from? It's rented. It's rented, and we had okay. a caretaker. So they had a caretaker, um, which was just another FLDS guy, and he had the license by my dad. My dad basically says you're okay to like you know, um, wear wear t-shirts and stuff, so uh, that he to, could be so in that you could fit into the community. Well. And but we couldn't see him in that stuff. So mm. basically, he had to change in the garage and then come in the house. Oh wow! Uh, well, and we didn't really talk about that a whole lot. the The style of clothing that has to be worn by FLDS adherents. You 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 said there are Gentiles here. We can tell because they're wearing T shirts. Yeah. What do men and women typically have to wear? So it's it's like a, it's a one piece underwear thing. Um, the magic we, underwear. Yeah, the magic <laughs> underwear. Except for we didn't have like symbols or whatever the Mormon church um, LDS people have on there. Oh, really? You didn't have the no. compass and square? Basically, or... we were told it was in preparation for when we actually got to go to the temple. Oh, okay. Uh, so once we got to go to the temple, then we would, you know, have like the special underwear. Hmm. But for now, we had to like have Hanes, which Hanes is actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, uh, yeah, it was it was that it was, you know, had to be um uh, long jeans and it couldn't be faded. Um, it had to be like a solid color of jeans it had to be, um, you know, a, a long sleeve shirt. Um, and you know, working in, in the, the summer heat with that, oh, um, is, is, uh, pretty miserable sometimes. Well, yeah, you've got one piece underwear on underneath a long sleeve shirt and dark jeans yeah well and you kind of eventually adapt to it like you you uh you get acclimated yeah yeah you, yeah, you, you acclimate to it so it's and, and then eventually you just sweat so dang bad that like you know your your whole body's drenched and then like when the wind blows it's like oh <laughs> <laughs> that's the best wind ever <sighs> yeah that still sounds like it kind of sucked oh it did <laughs> 
<laughs> now I'm just like, oh man, t-shirts are so nice. Oh yeah. So nice. I'm a fucking ginger. That's how my mom would make me mow the lawn when I was a kid. <laughs> Plus a big hat. Yeah. I'm like, and, and then, so I would mow a big section of the yard and then just stand under the hose like, oh, this is the best hose ever. I'm going to marry this hose when I get older. This is great. Don't you still wear a big hat when you mow? Yeah, I do most of the time. Because Dude. I hate being sunburned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're still ginger. And it happens like that whenever I go outside. Mm -hmm. No kidding. That happened to me down there. <laughs> you just get sunburned real easy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gingers. Sucks. It's fucking awful. I'm sure that's... <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure that's why your dad didn't like you a whole lot, I, but I feel like I'm... <laughs> it probably is. That's what it was. I knew there was something. <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of getting ahead of myself there. So you've talked, uh, you've talked on, in other interviews about how uh, you had this feeling or sense that your father just never liked you at all from day one for some reason. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't And I know. thought, well, it's obviously because he's a ginger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably why. No, and I remember thinking things like that as a kid. Like, I part my hair on the right, and my dad did it on the left, and most of my brothers did it on the left. And so I was like, you know, that's, there's, there's, you know, that's, I'm going to hell. Like, you know, um, it's got to be what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and I remember for the longest time, like, I parted on the left anyway, and I had like the weirdest looking hair <laughs> because of it. And so, yeah, that, no, I would, I would definitely, um, um, internalize a lot of that stuff. But yeah, for some reason, I don't know why it seemed like he, um, kind of went out of his way. Like when I say I was in hiding and stuff, um, you know, he, he called me back in, uh, 2004. Um, he, he called me and he says, you're the only one of my children that's not worthy enough or good enough oh. to come to Zion a out of all of his kids, you know? Do you and, think that it, do you think he said that to anybody else? No, cuz they he, were all like it wasn't just something that he would say to try to bring people into line like he, do you he think it may was have. like he'd said it only to you? He may have, but um yeah. the, the but they were all there. Like, it, they were all in Texas. Oh, yeah. 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 So he and, called me and said that, you know, you're not good enough, but all the other ones are. As a tactic, I could see that being ex uh, successful or effective, but from an emotional standpoint, it doesn't fucking matter. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, like the effect that it would have on him is on well, Roy just, is still For me, it just was and, like, yeah, I'm a piece of shit. And yeah, yeah, all yeah. that. I mean, it just basically reaffir reaffirmed or just kind of drove home the fact that I was, you know, a piece of shit. So it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, no, it, for some reason, it felt like he, he went out of his way to do that. You know, I was the first one to... Um, you know, that he sent back to Short Creek after he promised that we would never go back and then it would become a, it became condemnation to have to be sent away for things like to be, have to be sent away to hiding, have to be sent away to Short Creek, uh, to have to be sent away to work. And I was the first one that he put through all of those things. Um, you know, eventually after, you know, years, then he put the, he started having the other ones go out and work and stuff. Um, but for some reason he, he, he would isolate me and then like any message he got or I got from him, it was like, you know, if you are good enough, then you can come back with the family. Like, so it was just kind of the same. And, and by, by the time I left, that's, you know, my, why, why my mindset was nobody, none of the other families ever going to leave. Like, you know, that's mm -hmm. why I felt like I was never going to see him again mm -hmm. was because of how that isolation had happened so much. That I was like, I'm the only bad one. I'm the only bad son. And so that's why I'm never going to see him again. But, you know, definitely wrong there. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, I, I had wondered if, if that was maybe just something that he used as a tactic with a lot of people that he wanted to bring in line is like, you're not worthy. Yeah. You need to do X, X, Y, and Z before you become worthy, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I didn't know that everybody else was already there in texas so. yeah and he he may have done that with other people i don't know but just mm. my personal experience um that's um you know it, it he, he definitely felt like we he went out of his way to do it well did you ever hear him praise anybody else in in the in the church it was very you know, rare. Say that brother so and so is doing an exemplary job of this or that or sister so and so is doing wonderfully not very often. It was it was usually only of like um like his counselors like Wendell Nielsen or Fred Jessup or Merrill Jessup. 
um, you know, he would praise them to the moon and back generally, um, you know, like they're one with me, whatever. Um, but he didn't, I, I mean, like I never, I remember getting one compliment from him and I was, I remember being like, what the heck? Because he gave me a compliment telling, you know, thanking me for how good I had been. But I had recently just started masturbating again. And I was like, <laughs> this doesn't add up. Like, you're supposed to have revelation to and know. know that I'm being good. But I just barely started masturbating. So what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and you so don't he's know like, anything. I saw he's an like, ankle. <laughs> no. He's like, thank you for like being good or whatever. And, you know, let me go to a land of refuge. And I was just like. Okay. So. <laughs> huh. Hi, this is Yvette Dontremont, aka the Cybabe, and you're listening to Godless Revolution. You can find me at cybabe.com, at my Twitter account at the Cybabe, and if you've hunt really hard, you can find me at Pornhub. I dare you. The problem is to have a way of thinking about the world that doesn't allow you to reliably navigate because you are not basing your your worldview on evidence and argument. That's the problem. Thank you to everybody who has rated the show on iTunes and Stitcher and are following us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And to all our Patreon patrons, you make the show possible. You mentioned earlier <laughs> that you constantly felt guilty after the age of eight because this is the age of accountability yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And you constantly had things going on in your mind. And I remember uh, listening to part of Lindy's, Lindsay's podcast and interview with you where you talked about sending your dad letters all the time. Yeah. What, what were, what were those? Confession letters. It was, it was always, um, I mean, I remember, I remember at the age of 13, I think I wrote a 12 page letter to him. Wow. Um, cause I was like, you know, confessing anything that I did, you know, anything that I thought. I did or confessing my thoughts. It was just like, you know, just a lot of, um, just analyzing what am I thinking and confessing it and, um, and sitting there trying so hard not to think bad that you think bad and then you have to confess it. And so it's just kind of a whole circular thing. And so it was just a, a yeah, you, don't think about an elephant. And the first thing in your mind is, is an, elephant. an elephant. Right. Yeah. You know, and so it's, and that became the thing with, with sex or, or sexual attraction. By the time I left, it, it kind of hit me after I left, I was like, he spent so much time telling us not to think about the opposite sex, that that's all we were thinking about and then punishing ourselves for thinking about it. And then it was just like a whole uh, it was, it was a, kind of a, a circular, just, you know, kept going, um, chain reaction or whatever, but yeah. Um, forgot the question. <laughs> oh, just, I was asking you about the letters and you, oh, yeah. you had sent so just many of confession. them. Too. It was all uh, confession. Yeah. Confession letter after confession letter. Hmm. So you bounced around, he put you in hiding, would send you back to short Creek. Did you ever end up in Texas for any amount of time? Yeah, so um, after two and a half years of being in hiding and him telling us, telling me that I was not worthy to see him, um, uh, then he allowed us to come down from uh, Albuquerque to El Dorado, Texas, and I was there for, I was there for three weeks, and at the end of three weeks, he got caught in Vegas. And at that point, um, he immediately called back. Like, I think it was his first or second call out of prison. And that was my first experience of like public humiliation because, <laughs> because he called and it, we had a speaker system over the whole house. It was a huge house. Um, you know, with 130 odd people in it and, you know, had a speaker system, um, called in and was like, um, I want Roy to like, you know, go somewhere else, you know, sent me away. Um, so I was there for like three weeks and I didn't come back for over two years. And it was only, it was after the raid. So at that point it was like a lot of people were just coming in and out without, you know, um, without my dad's permission. And so that was, um, about three weeks was the extent of being there under my dad's, um, jurisdiction or his when he was kind of running the place hmm. 
Well, and he was caught with a bunch of money and stuff, too. Yeah, he was caught. I, I don't know how much it was. I, I seem to recall had, something like $200,000 yeah. or... He was always carrying tons of cash with him. Yeah. He always had tons of cash with him. Um, a lot of a lot of cash. Um, Got to have something to pay to the, the strippers else. with, man. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he he always he always had cash. He had a lot of oh, I you know like a lot of uh, wigs um, hmm. that we called it like disguise. Hmm. So it was you know shorts and t shirt and um, you know tanning lotion or whatever. Hmm. Um, I don't know anything you needed to do to try and get away from the FBI. Yeah, <laughs> and he did for a good year and a half. Yeah, you also mentioned school when you when we were talking earlier. Do they send you to public school or are you homeschooled? No, they don't send us to public school. Um, so up until about the age of ten, when I said things were sort of normal, mm. is we had uh, private schools. Um, um, that I went to, one I went to is Jeff's Academy. Um, but by the age of- It's Jeff's Academy. Come and see Jeff. Come to my school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it's Jeff's Academy. This is the prophet school. Oh, uh, that's last what, name Jeff. That's okay. what, that's what he would say all the time. This is the prophet why the, school. Why the hell didn't I make that connection? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I talking made to it. Roy Jeff, son of Warren Jeffs, and he's yeah. going to Jeff's Academy. <laughs> I, I made I, it instantly. Yeah, I was, I was. Well, whatever. I mean, it happens. I just, in my mind, the first thing I thought was like, oh, the modestly named. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff's. Again. But I had to get up yeah. super early for the graduation today. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not making some things click here. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So uh, that was kind of the private school we had in Colorado City, and then wait, who was who's over that? Like who who decides curriculum and and my dad. Okay, my dad well, did. So a lot about evolution and biology. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> about yeah. that. It was all priesthood history. Science was pretty much considered bullshit. Yeah, um, I hate. So it was just more church. Pretty much, it was it was a lot of that. I mean, we had um, English, we had um, oh, okay. you know math. Um, back then, we had you know a lot of like you know pub books that were published out here, and we would buy them. Um, but um, eventually, it it became where they they created or wrote their own books, and then you know. Um, distributed them from there and so then, your word problems and math were like no one needed 30 cubits of gopher wood and like that kind of thing <laughs> well it wasn't biblical related <laughs> basically what oh. they did oh yeah they didn't like the bible that much huh um no basically my dad had to teach it to us we didn't yeah. really my dad was like oh, i don't worry about reading it just um, yeah i'll pick I'll, out the good parts for you pretty much yeah, yeah. um no but um i lost the train of thought Oh, just School. public schools and what you were learning School. there. Matt talked about science and and evolution, and if you have to learn about gopher wood and cubits. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so that's what it was. So basically, they took um, they took a book that was say published out here um, that had you know games and toys and and things like that. Maybe crossword in puzzles and word searches and well, well, just anything that. Basically anything that referenced, um, uh, like a, a oh, having a normal life, have, right, having yes. a normal life, or, or like, <laughs> or like a, a a thing of the world, or an mm. event of the world, or worldly. anything that yeah. was worldly. Mm. They went through and replaced. So, like, instead of like a toy, it'd be like a shovel, and oh, um, instead of like a game, it'd be a work activity. And basically, they went through the whole thing. And just kind of rewrote it. How in can that we way. make school even less appealing no kidding. to people? I was thinking Put how bleak this damn sounds. shovel yeah. in there or a pick. <laughs> Bullshit. <Man. laughs> but no, um, so that's kind of what school became. Um, uh, after after uh, my dad kind of dissolved the private schools there in Colorado City, hmm. and then it just became homeschooling. I went down to Texas. That was sort of a school. Um, a sort of a private school, even though, like, I don't think we were licensed or anything. Mm. Um, and it was kind of the same thing, just, you know, all that, uh, religious propaganda infiltrated in it. But, um, no, we didn't have anything as far as science, social studies, um, U.S. history, world history, nothing like that. Mm. The only history, um, that we had 
that are related to like American history or world history is where um, it intertwined with um, LDS history mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, our, you know, priesthood history. So how did your brain not explode when you got cable? <laughs> it did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I sat there for days and days. Like I would just, I mean, I would go 72 hours without sleep, just oh, man. watching Netflix, like watching Dexter and stuff. Oh, yeah. just like, oh, well. sitting there like, and I'm doing construction. So it's like hard labor. And like, I'm like, oh shit, I got to go to work. Like I, after watching all night. And so I go to work, come home and I'm like, I'm not tired. Let's turn on Dexter again yeah. <laughs> all night again. And then just, it, it was miserable, <laughs> emotionally very taxing. <laughs> it's interesting to think that, you know, even, even in a world with all of those amenities and everything, we, we do acquire sort of an ability to figure out how to appropriately apportion our time. Yeah. That kind of stuff. For, for that. And, Cause it is certainly addicting. I mean, binge, oh, wa yeah. binge watching with Netflix is a huge thing, but I mean, I can only imagine for someone who doesn't, who has no experience with that, how that, that allure would just take over. I mean, you, you would. Yeah. You're, you're pretty much a, uh, um, a kid in a candy store, right. except for if all the candy was pot, maybe I don't know. <laughs> something even better. Oh, crack. Than that, yeah. yeah. Crack yeah. something. Yeah. But no, I, I, You're yeah. total babe in the woods. Just, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I started, like I ran my, I, I was streaming. So I, I had a, I had a, a cell phone, uh, a Samsung S5 or, or four or something. And I was, I was streaming data, um, through my phone to my laptop watching movies. Mm. Racked my bill up to like $1,900. Yeah. I was gonna say, oh, that geez. bill shows up. <laughs> Yeah, because that was back before the days of unlimited data. And so it was just like, I was just like, oh, I'll pay for it later. I need to watch a movie right now. <laughs> oh, damn. So man. that that was shortly before I left. Then after I left, I found out Netflix um, um, existed. And then that was pretty bad. Actually, <laughs> really good. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, what, what was the biggest shocker to you when you came out? Like the first thing you got to experience that was like maybe forbidden to you before or just something you got to do that you always wanted to do that you weren't allowed to do while you were in? Mm. Grape soda. <laughs> That's probably it. <laughs> no, probably sex. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We are human. Yeah. Except for Matt. <laughs> <laughs> You're an alien. I guess so. <laughs> so you were watching, so you were doing all the Netflix and stuff while you were still in I didn't, I didn't, I found out Netflix existed the week I left, um, right after I left. Then one of my cousins that I was sleeping on their couch and they're like, why don't you get Netflix? And I was like, what the fuck is Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't say that. I didn't say the word fuck until a year after I left, but. Um, now you love it. It's the yeah, best. Now I'm just like, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> 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 no, um, no, they were like, yeah, why don't you get Netflix? And so I got Netflix and, um, I, I binge watched, um, a show called Nikita. Hmm. Um, and then like I, I, uh, started getting too worried. They were like, it, that it was a mind control. Oh. <laughs> so I quit watching it. I quit watching it for a while because I was like, they had in the show, then they have like this thing that like controls your mind and it, they, it like goes up your nose, mm -hmm. inserts into your brain and then like, um, you know, makes you see things or whatever. And it was part, partially that, partially sleep deprivation. <laughs> Um, just everything. I was like, I can't watch this show anymore. Well, plus, plus an entire childhood around, around fear tactics and oh, yeah. paranoia. Oh I yeah. Mean, well, and, and we were told that, you know, the world was bad. And I think right. another thing that would have been a big surprise to me was finding out that people out here were monsters or the people, there were people that actually cared. Um, so that was, that was a huge thing for me finding that out. Cause we were taught that everybody was out to get us mm -hmm. if we left, like, you know, and they scared me and cause I was going to leave about, um, eight months before I did. And they scared me into staying because they told me, you know, the FBI is going to come after you. They're going to try and get you to turn against your dad. Um, they're not going to let you have a job. If you do get a job, you're like, you're not going to be able to get education and nobody's going to let you have a place to stay. Um, they're because just, of all the shit just, we did to you. Yeah. Well, just <laughs> fucking assholes. <laughs> just because, just because they're like, you have to turn against your dad. If you don't turn against your dad, then you're just done for. Like even the people in the world are going to look at you with this disgust. 
So it was um, finding out that that was false was very relieving. Did you search out any other religions when you left the FLDS church? Yeah. Um, I So the day, not the day, so I, I left, um, flew over here to Salt Lake City, um, and I got in touch with a, with a charity um, here. Uh, a nonprofit and they, um, it was, it was, you know, I, I met them at a church. Um, and now how did you even know to contact anybody like that? Was I, I had Googled them. Oh, I had Googled okay. them. Yeah. So you were, you were taking steps to prepare leaving. It wasn't like you just left in them. In the oh no, I very, it was very much either. an impulse. Yeah. It was very much an impulse. And I called them like on my last dollar. Like I was just like, I, I think I had $2 in my bank account. Mm-hmm. Um, and I called them asking for, you know, some sort of, um, help if they had like a place for me to stay. Mm-hmm. I think that's, I says, if you guys can get me a place to stay for maybe two months, I can get on my feet and, you know, be out of your hair, which I did. Um, but, um, so, so I, I got with this nonprofit, um, and then I went back down there to get some of my stuff. I went back down there to get some of my stuff and, um, you know, all of my uncles and all of the, the, um, the hierarchy or whatever, they got on a conference call, got me on the phone and were, you know, just basically the same shit over. Like you're going to hell, they're going to do this and this and this. I was just kind of like, by then I, I experienced this, you know, being around these people. So, uh, it's Tanya tool with holding out help. Um, just the, the positive, um, influence that they had they were just genuinely interested in me Mm. um without any expectation and so i was like okay this is new like i haven't ever felt this and just being valued as a human being yeah Yeah. being valued as a human being and so i was just like when i went back down there they were telling me like you're jumping off a cliff you're whatever you know just basically you know death hell and the devil eternal damnation you're the prophet's son. So like your damnation is going to be like damnation (laughs) 4.0. So it's just going to be like absolutely horrible for you. Um, and so, um, but then I was like, okay, you guys have been telling me all this shit, but you know, I just talked to somebody that actually valued me. So that's kind of why I stayed. And then at the same, but at the same time, um, I was like, I just want to like, get this out of my head, like this, you know, running through my head of like, you're, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. So I went straight from Salt Lake or from, uh, the Hilldale drove back up here, went to a, uh, non-denominational church called South Mountain Community Church in Draper and, um, tried going there for a while, which I was very grateful that I did go there because it helped me get away from believing in my dad or believing that my dad was legitimate because mm. when I still when I left I still thought that he was legitimate I was going to hell um all but of he's this talking stuff. directly to the man in the sky yeah and- all of all of this stuff but um but going to that church helped me get away from that um and and just qu- actually question like where's your evidence for this um you know we claim to be this Christian um this the tr- the one and true church um, that's a Christian church. What yet we pretty much wholly disregard the Bible, except for like, um, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then like the mm-hmm. rest of it, we just pretty much don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, wh- why are we doing all of this stuff and going being diamet- diametrically opposed in a lot of ways to what Jesus said? Um, you know, like I don't know. One that always stuck out to me is like, who he who forbiddeth to marry is like a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it went. He said it just like word that. Word for word. <laughs> hey man, That's what like, it said in Hebrew. If you're not going to let people get married, you're a total piece of shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it said in Hebrew, in the Hebrew, tra- Hebrew translation. Yes. No. Um, so that was one thing that stuck out to me. Just a, few, a lot of different things that, that um, were diametrically opposed to, to what my dad had been teaching us. And I was like, okay, like, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, this was just all a big con on me and my dad's right. But then I was like, OK, but what if it's exactly opposite? It's my my dad's the con on me and these guys are right. 
So I tried to go that route for a while mm -hmm. um, with 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 that church, but then eventually, because they were like, you know, you can't go with this feeling, you can't go with this testimony, you actually have to look at the evidence. So I, was, you know, like you know, and so I was like, okay, yeah, cool, like I can do that, and and I I did that for a while, and like I got all these warm and fuzzy feelings in the in the church for a while, but then I was like, okay, when it became time to start looking at the uh, the non denominational church too. I was like, you guys have some of the same fucking holes. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have evidence. You you still want me to have this super good feeling that I'm forgiven. And um, so so it kind of came around, The kind of went full circle. It was just like, um, I, I went through the exact same thing um, of, of, of being like, okay, if, if um, how do I know that, um, the whole story of Jesus wasn't just a cover up for an affair. Like, um, yeah. like there's no actual physical evidence that a woman could get pregnant without sex. Yeah. So, how do I know? I'm, I'm like, that'd be a perfect cover up, or, or you know, be like, God did it. Yeah, you might as well try it at least, because death is the other option. Yeah. Right at that time and place. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, and you know, it definitely drive you to do some extreme shit, but, mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of that, that same thing. And then I'm like, also you guys, you guys rail against the book of Mormon and how false it is because it's just a book and you, they want us to have a feeling, but you're doing the exact same thing. You're just not asking me to have a testimony of Jesus. You're just asking me to accept his grace and like, you know, have a testimony, but just kind of go in a roundabout way explaining like how you know i'm forgiven and like and like i felt that for a while um but but then it was just kind of a a big crisis when i was just like i can't do this like i have these urges like i want to have sex and stuff but i go to this church and they're like you know it's okay if you sin but don't sin you're forgiven if you sin but don't sin and i'm like <laughs> Like, where's this, the sense? <laughs> this is, there, there's so much confusion here. Because when I did have sex, like, I felt horrible. I went and told Tanya, because she's she's kind of been my surrogate mom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I went and told her, and I was like, you know, she was like, that's okay. Like, you're forgiven, whatever. And I was like, cool, but I still did it. And like, I'm going to do it again because it was really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> but then I was like, I can't be like, I want to be this Christian. But if I'm going to be a true Christian, then I need to follow the words of, of like Christ or whatever. And but I but at the same time, like I want to have sex, but I can't. Um, it, it's, it's just so conflicting right mm -hmm. there. Uh -huh. But there she's like, oh, but you're forgiven. I'm like, well, it's going to keep happening, but. Well, great. Then I can keep having sex and keep being right. forgiven. But right? then like, I'm like, works well, then me, what the fuck is the point of the <laughs> yeah. Bible yeah. at that point? <laughs> and so I was super confused with their, their outlook on it. And I was like, if I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to have to be a Christian that follows the Bible exactly as it says. And I was like, okay, now I'm jumping back into this cult territory where I just do stuff. Because that's what the book says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of went back into the same thing where it was like, I don't have, um, like, like I have these urges, these, these natural human urges. And even, even Tanya was telling me, like, this is natural to feel this way. And I'm like, okay, but it's a sin at the same time. So that makes no sense. That um, God guy, what an asshole, right? Giving you all of these <laughs> no natural kidding. tendencies and urges and no making kidding. it feel great and then telling you not to do it. Yeah, no kidding. This is New Name Noah, and you're listening to The Godless Revolution. Um, I have a moral challenge on this point. Answer me this if you think that morality comes from the supernatural, and we require celestial dictatorship permission for it. N name me a moral action committed by a believer, or a moral statement, or an ethical statement uttered by one, that could not be made or uttered by an unbeliever. I've asked this in a number of venues and forums now. I'm going to keep on asking it. I've not yet had an answer. If I was to ask anyone in this room, however, could they name a wicked action performed or a vile statement made by someone attributable only to their religious faith, there isn't a single person here who would have to hesitate for a second in discovering what that was and saying it. 
If you have questions, comments, concerns, compliments, corrections, criticisms, or concepts for content, contact the show via email at godlessrevolution at gmail.com, by text or voicemail at 330-81-REBEL, or Twitter the twatter at TGR Podcast. Thank you! And so sex was a was a big thing, like going through that, realizing that that I couldn't be a true Christian if I kept doing it. Mm. And then, you know, for a while I was just like, I don't really give a shit, like whatever. I don't really like, like I didn't want to out of fear. I didn't want to say anything bad about Jesus or God or anything. Might be watching. Yeah. Might be there. <laughs> might be watching. Um, Sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. <laughs> it's kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> He's in your closet when you're fucking. <laughs> Put a mirror in there and see if it scares him. <laughs> oh, shit. I look like that. Um, <laughs> oh, God's watching me. Wait, I'm God. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so we're, we're coming up on our two-hour mark, and I want to make sure that we can get to some of the questions that uh, listeners had sent in that they wanted to ask you. Um, and then we can we can talk about more things, but I want to make sure that I get these done because people took time to send them in to us. Uh, listener Taylor Grin says, having come from such an insulated culture, what would you say is the most direct or efficient way to help people out of a cult? What were the most critical points of your journey out? So that's going to depend on 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 who the person is, like wh- where. The, the cult that I came from, you'll have a lot of um, moms, uh, single moms with a lot of kids. Like, and, and I don't mean a lot by four. I mean a lot by like eight or ten. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so situations like that, then they need, you know, more financial, more um, like, like physical support, you know, like a house, like a roof over their head, things like that. Um, but the, the biggest thing for me um, was and, and what holding out help played a massive role. And was just um, um, not not just providing a roof over my head, but it was um, providing um, emotional support. Mm-hmm. Just somebody there that wasn't going to judge me, mm-hmm. because I still believe in my dad. For months after I left, mm-hmm. they didn't judge me. Um, they didn't talk disrespectfully about him um, in front of me. So that was that was a huge thing. Is is just understanding don't think even though they are like super weird don't call them out for it (laughs) it is it is it is like looking back now i'm like holy shit that was weird like i was super weird but but don't call them out for it because they genuinely believe things like that like it's something that they are very genuine about and you just have to show them that there's a better way but you can't preach it to them you can't go to their face and say there's a there's a better way, and you know you really need to believe this way. You can't. Hmm. Baby you steps. Can't do that. Yeah, baby steps, and just being there, just like physical presence of somebody else that gives a you know cares about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the it biggest just thing. Listens to you and actually, yeah, responds. Or back. it's just there to talk to about yeah. anything. So it's it's just emotional support is the biggest thing that I can think of that hmm. helped me. I think that's a great answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shanti McMillan wonders, how has his perspective towards women changed since leaving? Was it a factor in him leaving? Um, I would say, so I'd answer the second one first. Um, it was somewhat um, of a factor, somewhat of a factor mm-hmm. in, in me leaving in that I, like I wanted to have a family um, and, and stuff like that. But my, my perspective towards women, um, it took a long time for me to to change from a very misogynistic um, standpoint mm-hmm. to to be like or to to get to the mindset now um, where I'm like, okay, women are are human beings too. They have every right that I should, you know, they should have every right that I have. Mm. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not so, and, and a lot of people that come from my culture are still in, in that misogynistic sort of mindset. And it's really hard to get out of. Mm-hmm. Um, but my perspective on, on, on women is just, um, I, I, I have the, the utmost respect for them. 
um, putting up with men for as long as they have. <laughs> like, no kidding. Like, if I would have been a woman, like, I would have killed all the guys a long time ago. <laughs> like, they put up with so much shit. For men, my, my, I, I'm like, now I'm just like, like take the reins. Like, I'm good. You, you, be, the, you be in charge. Like, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's changed drastically. Because in there, women are, are um, inferior um, they're there to support the man. They're there to bow to the man's wishes. And that's just how it is. And even when I left, I remember having the hardest time thinking, you know, I, I, I'm like, how am I going to find somebody that is going to obey me? <laughs> oh God! And I was just like, I remember thinking like, I don't think it's going to happen out here. Like, <laughs> yeah, probably I not. might need to adjust my views. And, yeah. So, so I kind of had to get a harsh realization that it's a whole different thing and that women are actually people and I need, you know, I can't treat, treat women like they're subordinate, should be subordinate. I think that was a great answer also. <laughs> very, very honest answer there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Patrick Keller says, how many others from his family are able or willing to leave? Do they have anyone that can help them? So there definitely is um, growing support. Um, there's a, a nonprofit called Holding Out Help um, that um, they, they are Christian, um, Christian based. They, you know, they say they're non-judgmental, like they don't realize, you know, in some ways they are. Um, um, or, or in some ways they kind of lean towards that. They can't mm -hmm. help themselves. They don't realize it, but they do a lot of good. Yeah. And so there is groups like that, um, holding out help. Um, Lindsay Hansen Park has another, um, nonprofit. So there, there is, um, there is people that are, are there and, and a lot of donating to charities like that, um, will definitely help will definitely help with, with just getting a roof over a single mom's head with a lot of kids, things like that. Um, now, the, there, there's a lot of my family members that um, would be able to leave, um, but basically being able to leave and being um, willing are, are two totally different things because you, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a personal journey. Um, like you can't, right. you can't go up to somebody and try and convince them to leave. If you run into, a um, somebody that's in the cold, that's out there, like on a construction site or something, the last thing that's ever going to do any good is to try and tell them that they're wrong and they need to leave. Um, and that's a totally a personal journey. Um, but, but a lot of them are able, most of them aren't willing to just out of fear. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I mean, they. I can't imagine that they would have stuck around well, if because, it weren't for a sense of fear and yeah. you know, fear of the unknown, fear of what are they going to do, fear of punishment, fear of retribution, fear yeah. of you know losing their eternal soul to well, damnation. And that's the or biggest fear is, is losing yeah. your eternal soul. And so it's it's a huge, huge motivator to stay, even though you know a lot of them have you know not a lot of money, but they have some money. Like when I left, I had some money. To be able to get a flight to, you know, from Des Moines, Iowa to here. Mm. Um, so they they have the ability to at least leave, but most of them aren't willing to, um, just because of the fear, um, that, that, um, is being projected on them. Well, yeah. I mean, how, how bad does something have to get where you're like, the consequences of me staying can't be any worse than the consequences or potential consequences? Of me leaving, right? I mean, so. Right. Well, and that's where it got to me. I was like, so okay. So it's, if... it's both bravery and desperation, yeah. I would imagine. So you, in some you amount feel like you're quitting, the... but once you leave, you're like, holy shit, that took a lot of courage. Right. To actually do right. it. But when you're doing it, you feel like you're an absolute failure and you're quitting. You feel mm -hmm. like an absolute, just the worst quitter that ever existed. <laughs> so that's kind of, but once you get out, you're like, wow, that took a lot to actually do that. So yeah, it's a it's a weird oxymoron. Wow. But. Well, congratulations and for to you for get for being able to get out. Well, thank you. And it's, uh, it's been very good for for being as well adjusted as you are. I mean, you've yeah, been out for dude. what two three years now? Three, three years, almost just just over three. Man, years. I can't believe so. that like 
does it seem like a long time to you since then? It seems like so fucking long. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, I have learned so much. Like, like most people, like I'm, I'm a pretty liberal, like I'm a liberal atheist now. Oh. Mm-hmm. And that's like a huge stretch oh. from oh, yeah. where that's I That's like come a 180 from. flip. It's pretty anywhere. much a yeah. complete yeah. 180. And, and generally it would take like, sometimes I'm like, holy shit, dude, like why so fast? <laughs> but I always have a mindset of like, I got to do it. I got to do it right now. And so once I decided, you know, once I um, made the the change from becoming like, or from being um, like a, just an asshole conservative to, you know, changing to become a, you know, like a liberal and stuff, then like I was like, okay, now I'm a liberal. So, okay, now we're just going to do like liberal shit. Yeah, you seem more normal than a lot of Mormons I meet. <laughs> around here right? yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah who have left mainstream mormon religion yeah yeah, yeah. that 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 or uh, are still in it a lot yeah. of those a lot of those um um conservative ideologies and stuff like that that i just found like i was like okay why do i believe this why do i have this view and i found that a lot of that was rooted in the religious values that i thought i had or mm-hmm. that i thought were pertinent mm-hmm so it was like okay once i once i gave those up it was like you know this is this is ridiculous like i can't i can't um honest be honest with myself and still have this you know view towards women or you know this be this racist or, <laughs> or anything else no we we were we, we were like i will admit we were very racist yeah we didn't think we were because we thought that you know um, African Americans were inferior, but um, that's what we were taught from the age of mm-hmm. you know. Well, that's yeah, that's, that's just all how God knew. made. That's, that's all you knew. We're not yeah. we're not racist. That's just and the so, truth. Right? So yeah. yeah, God's the racist. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and so so we were taught that um, you know the the curse that Noah put on mm-hmm. on Ham's children. We were taught that African Americans were Ham's children. Mm-hmm. Right, and so that's why they you know that's why like when when Barack Obama, like the greatest president ever. <laughs> um, when he, when he became president, we were like, okay, this is bad. Like this nation has gone to hell because they have an African American there. And like, and, and that's what I found. Literally someone who was cursed by Satan. No kidding. Yeah. And they were, were supposed to be God. a servant yeah. of servants. And, right. and so when I finally was like, okay, when I actually listened to him talk, I was like, holy shit, this dude is actually pretty fucking good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he's not this terrible person that, and I was like, okay, where was this bias? It was based in race, racism, not in actual policy or mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, like he's far more of a like a better christian than donald trump <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah well and it's oh, interesting man. too how conservatives don't you know they don't recognize that obama's really african you know like he's, <laughs> yeah he's also white like <laughs> right but any sort of black in there yeah is it's just like, the whole just, thing it's yeah, just, just like a load of laundry. They just they one just color like ruins the whole white batch of whites. <laughs> it's it's yeah. detrimental to well, society. It's just not cool. Uh, yeah, I have another comment that we can talk about in the in the uh, after show part of the show. Um, before we go, I have one more comment from a listener who says, uh, "This is from uh, Chad Jeffrey Russi. He says, "I don't have a question, Dan. Just a statement." Let him know that there are people like my wife and self that have read his story and support his actions to leave the FLDS on his own accord. Let him know we believe he has inner courage for doing so and that we would never personally discriminate against him for his upbringing and that we accept him just the way he is. Let him know that while some people might bully him or ridicule him, that in those challenging moments to know and remember that there are people, strangers to him even, that care about him and wish him the best moving forward in his new life. I appreciate here, here. I appreciate that very much, Chad. And um, it, it's it's people like you that that um, make it feel like it's you know th- that give us validation in coming out, um, coming out of a cult like that, and you know finding out that people out out here. I mean, there are definitely monsters, and I've been yeah. I've been um, I've ran into monsters, you know, and and had some bad things happen to me since I've left. Um, but there's also a lot of just generally. Um, people are, are decent and pe- generally people care. So, and, and, and thank you, Chad. Yeah. Thank I thought that was much. a great yeah. comment. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for that, Chad. And thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Yeah, absolutely. This has been I'm, fantastic. Yeah, I'm very glad to be here. You've been a wonderful guest. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're going to, we're going to keep you around and talk to you some more in the after show for the, uh, Patreon. for our Patreon patrons. 
Yeah. Um, and then we're going to Netflix until 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably go home and do that. <laughs> uh, if you would like to also become a Patreon subscriber, you can do so very easily by going to patreon.com slash godlessrevolution. And for as little as a dollar per episode, you'll be able to hear wonderful extended episodes, some bonus content. You'll get to hear more from Roy in our after show. Uh, I want to thank our current Patreon subscribers, Christy Kalbach, Andrew Vodapich, Jefferson, Mo Cowbell, Wes Aaron, <laughs> Utah Outcasts, Andy Faulkner, Angelica Pearson, Jeremy Goodson, Brandy Hamrick, Taylor Grin, Grant Larimer, Savit Acuna, and The Gaytheist. Thank you very much. Thank you all very, yes, very thank much. You. Matt will not be with us for the next couple episodes. Yep. Going on a vacation. Ish. Ah. A workcation, more uh, like, probably. A workcation. Um, I believe that the Purple Dragon Ooh, is making an appearance. Is going to be joining us in studio for those two episodes. So that should be fun. And next week should be a good one too. Again, yes. Next <laughs> week, <laughs> next week we will be speaking with Lloyd Evans. He's the senior editor at JWSurvey.org. So we're going to be talking to him all about Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, Witnesses, which should be interesting because mm -hmm. I really am not very versed in that realm. I am not either. I know some things, but I know I know about so the I'm light looking tower forward to this and because, stuff. Yeah, to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing to, to learning a lot more about mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses and why they decide to leave torture porn on my <laughs> on my porch like once a month. <laughs> I will be interested in downloading and listening to that episode, <laughs> and we will miss you very much. <laughs> I'm sure. So until next time, crucify that like button. Don't forget to leave a review to achieve nirvana. And as always, rate the show five times a day toward Mecca. So this is only like another two hours or so, like the first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been in church longer. I can handle That's true. Dude, I knew I was, it was coming. I was so fucking disappointed at Gray's graduation today. They had a, uh, in the fucking thing, they had an award for the, LDS Student Alliance uh, for the College of Sciences. And I'm like, you guys don't do science! Yeah. <laughs> That's so high. fucked up. I'm making all kinds of noise with my microphone here. Sorry. Well, that's, that's for just for the Patreons. Well, like, Ooh, scratchy, it's, scratchy. It's, it's Dan's beard noises. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mating call in some states. <laughs> so, <laughs>